Hi, uh, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, if you haven't seen these shows before, uh, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell uh, with offices in Worcester, Westboro, and Boston. These shows are about the folks that I talk about a lot when I do seminars uh, in your community and in surrounding communities. My friends Frank and Mary. Uh, my friends Frank and Mary, and today we're going to talk specifically about elder law for singles. We recently talked about Frank and Mary uh, and they were both, when they were both alive and we were talking about elder law for the both of them and we talked about elder law and how those elder law issues might change for them uh, as their ages changed. Uh, we talked about the fact they had three children, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. In this presentation, however, we're assuming that Frank is no longer around. Either he died or they got divorced because things weren't going well, but in either way, uh, Mary's need for an elder law plan has fundamentally changed. Um, and we're going to assume in this part of the presentation that Mary is 70 years old and, and talk about the kinds of things she has to have, especially now that Frank is, for whatever reason, no longer around. First of all, she has to have a health care proxy. In her old proxy, she may very well have named Frank as the person who was going to take care of things for her if her doctor said she couldn't make any medical decisions anymore. That obviously now has to change. So she needs to figure out who that proxy is going to be, who her agent is going to be. In this situation, she could name one or more of her children, but only one at a time, because in a healthcare proxy, you can only name one person at a time. If I'm the doctor and I want to be talking to, to figuring out what to do in a case where you've got a medical crisis, I don't want to be talking to a whole bunch of kids and having them arguing. I only want to talk to one at a time. Where does your proxy go once you've done it? Make sure it goes to your doctor. Get the proxy scanned in to your medical record by your doctor. He's actually, he or she is actually required to do that under state law if you offer it, if you bring it to them. And that way, if you go to the hospital, instead of having to try to fill out a form at the hospital, which you may or may not be able to do at the time, you can simply get your doctor or your proxy can have your doctor email that to the hospital so they'll have it on record. Uh, power of attorney. Um, dealing with your medical issues is fine, but who is going to take care of all of your financial matters? Go to the bank, call the insurance company, deal with a million things while you're, while, if you're incapacitated. In this case, once again, you may want to name one or more of your children, which you, in this case you can. You can name many of your children jointly and severally so that anyone could act for you. Or if you've got one child that you especially trust, and, and then you may want to just name that child and name others as alternates. Uh, no witnesses are required for a power of attorney here in Massachusetts. Notarization of that document is preferred, not that it is legally required unless the attorney uh, is actually using that power of attorney in order to, to transfer real estate for you in the registry of deeds. But many people who you're showing the power of attorney to, uh, when they see the notarization, assume that it's a valid legal document. If they don't see a notarization, often they'll question it. You don't need to have people questioning the power of attorney at that point. Remember that if you do a new power of attorney, it does not revoke the old one. So if you had an old power of attorney and you're married and you named Frank, remember that by doing a new one, naming only your kids, you have not revoked the old one to Frank. Um, uh, what you need to do is send him a notice, if he's still alive, uh, revoking it, and also notify especially your financial institutions that you've made this change. Um, or a couple of things about the power of attorney. Um, you, you want to make sure, in general, that that power of attorney uh, does not limit the ability of your attorney to make gifts on your behalf. That's going to be very important as we talk about probate avoidance and also about asset protection later on. Um, you also want to make sure that the power of attorney has the ability to make gifts and, and to transfer real estate if you have real estate. Um, now, Let's talk about what Mary needs to look at in terms of getting her estate plan right. The estate plan meaning the plan regarding what happens to her assets after she dies. Um, she wants to look at four issues right off the bat. I just want to mention the one at the bottom first, grandchildren. So often um, a Mary, age 70, will say, to, will say to me, well, you know, I really want to leave some of these, this money directly to the grandchildren. They have college needs, et cetera, et cetera. Just remember if you are doing that, that you may be giving this gift not to your grandchild who, is, who you hope will go to Harvard, but rather to Harvard. Because when, when, if that child gets in, 
um, the the so the the fat so-called FAFSA form, or or which is the kind of the major form that is used to figure out college aid, will consider the amount that is available for that grandchild and will subtract it from the amount of their their student aid. So it probably makes more sense in that situation to give the assets to the children versus giving it to the grandchildren. Now, regarding the children, if you're assuming as Mary was that she was simply going to divide her assets into three big piles, one for each child, the questions that she wants to ask herself are, does, does one of those children have a creditor problem? Do they have a spouse problem? You don't want to leave money to that, that, it, that uh, daughter or son-in-law you never liked in the first place. And then do they have a disability problem? Because you want to make sure that you are not inadvertently um, um, disqualifying your child who has a disability for government benefits or inadvertently if your child has a creditor problem or a spouse problem giving assets or making assets exposed to those creditors or to that spouse in that case that you probably if you're married want to create a trust for the benefit of that child typically you name one of the other children as trustee as long as the children trust each other um, as long as you structure things that way, then the child whom you're trying to protect, their assets will be protected. As long as they don't have, that child does not have the legal right to force a distribution to himself or herself. Those assets are not exposed to the spouse or to the creditor. Now, once you've figured out, once Mary's figured out where the assets are supposed to be going, the next question is, how do they get there? Well, if Mary owns those assets the, at the moment of her death, then they're going to go, through, and, and there is no named death beneficiary for them, they're going to go through the probate process. Why avoid probate? You've all heard that you're supposed to be avoiding probate, but why? The reason is, the point of probate, first of all, is to make sure um, that, that the court figures out, the probate court figures out who gets what. Um, so that's the point of probate. If you have a will, the will gets filed with the probate court. The, will, the probate court decides that it's, whether or not it's valid, and if it is, those are the rules. If you don't have a will, then the, 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 the assets get distributed according to something called the rules of intestacy. But most importantly, that probate system is also designed to protect creditors. No distributions can be made of probate assets until at least a year after the date of death because creditors have one year from date of death to file claims against the probate estate. Uh, and by the way, if Mary died with a car or, or tangible personal property, property in the house, presumptively the spouse, if Frank was still alive, would become the owner. Now there is no Frank, so it's not clear who these assets are going to go to, so they need to go through probate. How do you avoid probate? First of all, having a will does not avoid probate. That's one of the most common mistakes that people walk into my office with, is they think because they have a will they've avoided probate. Um, and, and you want to avoid it, as I mentioned, because of this one-year delay and also because of the legal cost, which can be substantial. So in Mary's case, let's pretend these are Mary's assets. She has a home worth $350,000. She has savings just in her own name now. Perhaps they were originally with Frank, but no longer. She has an IRA and, a new, and an annuity. Each of those has a named death beneficiary, and therefore those assets won't, necessar won't go through probate. But regarding the bank account in the home, there will be a probate unless Mary figures out some other way to handle them. So there are, there are several ways to handle that issue. Um, and I'm going to talk about trusts a little bit later. But first, I just want to mention the others. If Mary owns an asset jointly with someone, with, not with Frank anymore, but now perhaps with one of her children, legally, the two of them own 100% of that asset, so that if Mary dies, her interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. A very common way for folks who want to avoid probate to, to avoid it, especially regarding bank accounts, is to put somebody's name on it with them jointly. That may work fine for you. The only thing you want to be sensitive to is once someone's on jointly with you, they own the account. They can pull money out of the account and a creditor of theirs can get to it. Um, another alternative regarding, uh, often regarding accounts, regarding IRAs, for example, and also regarding annuities, is to have a, a TOD, a transfer on death, or a POD, a pay, a pay on death provision, which will cause those assets to instantly go to the surviving person. That may be a very handy way for Mary to deal with these issues. The only thing that that doesn't do 
is it doesn't deal with possible contingencies. One of the kids, one of the kids has died, then where do the assets go, for example? And it doesn't deal with protecting them, as we had spoken about in the event that she's nervous about creditors, etc. Finally, there's last minute gifting. Mary literally could give everything away, could give every dollar that she owns away the day before she dies. And if she does that, none of those assets will be subject to probate. So if, it, so if, if that's a, a, a possibility for you, you may wanna to talk to the person who has your power of attorney because you don't wanna give away all of your assets right now, you wanna keep control of them, but you wanna make sure that there's somebody around to give them away the day before you die because you're probably not gonna be feeling very good that day. So you probably want to have a conversation with your attorney and say to the attorney, well, just before I die, please, if you can, distribute these assets. Finally, there is the trust. Um, folks will often talk to me about this, especially if they own a home. Probably the easiest way for Mary to keep control of her home, while at the same time making sure that it does not go through probate when she dies, is to have a revocable and amendable trust. Revocable in that she can take the assets out anytime, amendable in that she can amend it or just cancel the trust anytime. There are no negative tax implications to having such a trust. She, tr she would transfer the assets to herself as the trustee so that she remains in control. She, what she would probably do though is name one or more of her, other chi of her other children as joint trustees following her death and say in the trust that as soon as she dies, these new trustees will step into her shoes and can therefore immediately distribute these assets. The assets that are in trust will not have to go through the probate process. They won't be subject to that one year delay. They also won't be subject to the claims of any creditors. So it's a very handy technique for Mary to use. Finally, there is a state tax minimization. And I wanna talk about this for a while because increasingly, because of IRA's 401ks and real estate, I find myself with clients who have to deal with the Massachusetts estate tax. Um, let's go through once again what Mary's assets are. She has a total a asset value of $1,100,000, counting all of her assets. Uh, if she dies tomorrow, um, there will, she, someone is gonna need to make a computation as to whether or not she owes an estate tax. They're going to do that in two ways. First of all, they're gonna use this chart, a chart that was adopted almost 100 years ago by the Massachusetts legislature when they created the estate tax. At that time, if you had more than $40,000, you were considered to be fairly rich. And therefore, there's an estate tax chart that taxes all money over $40,000 um, um, at a graduate, on a graduated scale. The, more, the higher the amount of the money that you have, the higher the tax that you pay. As you note, when you look at the bottom of this chart, according to this chart, if Mary had a million dollars, she'd have an estate tax of $36,560 according to this chart, which is still in effect. If she had an estate of $1,100,000, which is what she has, her total estate tax would be $42,640. But I bet you heard that if you have an estate that's worth more than a million, that worth less than a million dollars, there is no estate tax. That's true. That's true. Because of a, a, not a change in this chart that was made to the legislature, by the legislature, but because of later decisions by the legislature to try to exclude people who had below a certain amount of money, there is an, an alternate way that you have to compute the estate tax. So if Mary died, you'd first compute the estate tax according to the chart. Then you'd use this, you'd use this chart, the alternate estate tax chart. It's very simple. If you has, have assets of less than a million dollars, you pay no estate tax. If you have assets of more than a million dollars, you pay 40% of all the dollars greater than a million dollars. Um, so you can, as you can see, so for example, if Mary had an estate of one million and one dollars, her estate tax would be 40 cents for, because it would be the lower of the amount under the, using this alternate or the amount using this chart. So as you can see, if she died with a million dollars using the chart, that number is 36,000 and something in estate tax. Using the alternate though, her tax would be 40 cents, 40% 40 of $1. If her tax were a million one hundred thousand dollars which actually is the amount that she has in this case, her estate tax using the chart would be $40,000 or 40% 40 of $100,000. Her, her, her tax using the, ch the, uh, the, uh, the uh, old chart 
is $42,000. She, she pays the lower of the two and therefore she would pay $40,000. So the point is there is always this alternate way of figuring out the estate tax. There's really only one way to avoid the estate tax if you're married and you're single. You have to give it away. You have to give your money away. The simplest way to do it um, would be to simply give away everything, to give, give away every dollar the day before you died. If you did, then there would be no Massachusetts estate tax. And contrary to this kind of perception, there is no gift tax. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. And while there is a federal gift tax, the federal gift tax only kicks in if the amount of your assets is equal to what the federal estate tax minimum is, which is over $11 million at this point. So effectively, there is no federal gift tax. So Mary could simply give away everything. For example, uh, say Mary's taxable estate were $1,300,000. And Mary's, in that case, Mary's estate tax would be $55,440. Suppose the day before she dies, Mary gives away $100,000, leaving her with a smaller estate, $1.2 million. In that case, Mary's estate tax would be $49,040. That gift would have saved Mary's kids $6,400. But now I want to talk about one other particular kind of gift, and that is giving to take advantage of the $1 million exemption. The reason why these gifts are more problematic is that for purposes of figuring out whether you can take advantage of that exemption, you have to add back in to Mary's estate any gifts that were made during her lifetime greater than $15,000 in one year to, to one person. Um, and, and if, the, once you've added all of that back in, the total value of her estate is more than a million dollars, the alternate tax is no longer available. She can no longer avoid the chart and she ends up paying an estate tax. For example, say that Mary's taxable estate was a million one hundred thousand dollars and the day before she dies she gives away one hundred fifteen thousand dollars the day before she dies. Remember, gifts in excess of fifteen thousand dollars per person per year have to get added back into the taxable estate for purposes of determining if she's over a million dollars and therefore can take advantage and, and, and if, she's, if her estate is over a million dollars, in which case she can no longer take advantage of the alternate chart. In this case, $1,100,000 minus the 115 um, plus 100,000, which has to get added back in, ends up making Mary's taxable income uh, more than a million dollars. Mary's taxable estate would then end up being $36,560 uh, calculated according to the chart. So it would be true that her estate had been reduced by $100,000, but the point is she's no longer going to be able to exclude everything. But now take the final example. Say that Mary's taxable estate is a million one hundred thousand dollars. Say that Mary makes seven gifts of $15,000 a piece, that is a total of $105,000 in gifts the day before she dies. So all the gifts were in these increments of $15,000 per person uh, or per year. As a result of that, Mary's taxable estate, for purposes of the, the estate tax, you, figuring out whether she can use the alternate estate tax chart, is only $995,000. So by doing these gifts the day before she dies, Mary has reduced her estate tax to zero. She's done a tremendous, a real favor for her kids by taking this one step that most people aren't aware that they have the ability to take. So that's a little bit about reducing the estate tax. For more on that though, you really need to talk to, talk to your, to your uh, estate planning lawyer about that. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about Mary at 80 instead of Mary at 70. Mary at 80, with the very same assets, has the same concerns about probate avoidance uh, and, and clearly about estate tax minimization. She has one more though, and that is a concern about nursing home care, asset protection in order to avoid going to a nursing home. Um, the, the reason is very simple. Mary knows that if she gets stuck going to a nursing home, the cost of that is going to be about around $14,000 a year. Uh, you may recall that Mary's income at this point is only $2,000 a year. 14 minus 2 is 12, so Mary's burn rate if she goes to the nursing home, that is the rate at which 
her other money would need to be used in order to pay for that nursing home care is $144,000. The question is, how can Mary reduce that number? How can she plan so that when she gets to the nursing home, she can qualify for mass health? Because once she can show that her assets are less than $2,000, while that $2,000, excuse me, the, while, once she can show that her assets are less than $2,000, her income, which is actually $2,000 a month, will need to continue to go to the nursing home, but the rest will be paid by MassHealth. Unfortunately, Mary doesn't have a husband anymore, so she simply can't give these assets to her husband the day before she tries to qualify for MassHealth. So she has only one real alternative. She needs to give her assets away to someone that she trusts and wait five years. That's the famous five-year look-back period. So, the first question that Mary needs to ask herself is, is there someone that she trusts so much that she's willing to transfer those assets to that person and, w and knowing that that person doesn't have to give any of those assets back to her at any time and then wait five years? Will that lo make her lose more sleep than the worry that in eventually at some point she may need nursing home care? If she's made that leap, then she could give away her assets to any one of her kids and simply wait five years. Regarding her home, what she would probably want to do is keep control of her home, that is keep a life estate in the home, control of her home until she dies, and transfer her to her children a something called the remainder interest in the home, that is the interest that starts after she dies. <clears throat> one of the reasons that she wants to do that regarding the home, this structure will avoid probate uh, it will also um, cause the step up in capital gains in capital gains basis so that when her kids sell the house, they'll only pay a capital gain on the difference between the, the house value at the time of death and what they sell it for. So it really helps her kids a lot. Um, <clears throat> the minuses of this, if she just transfers these assets to the kids, specifically if she transfers the house to the kids, if she needs to sell the house during her lifetime, there'll be a capital gains tax on a portion of the proceeds and she's going to need her kids consent in order to sell the house. For people who are concerned about those things, they may want to create an irrevocable trust. Every senior has heard about irrevocable trusts as the way of protecting your assets. So once again, I want to emphasize the only time you want to do that is if you don't have a spouse, because if you do, you can simply transfer the assets to him or her before you die. Uh, and if you have a child that you trust so much that you're willing to transfer the assets to them uh, and keep them under their control. The way the irrevocable trust would work is you'd name your most trusted child as the trustee, the manager of those assets. The, trustee would, the trust would specify that the trust is for the benefit only of the children. Mary cannot be one of the beneficiaries of this trust. There is no, she, the, the, this trust has to be irrevocable, that is, whatever assets she puts into the trust, she can't take back out of the trust afterwards. Um, and she doesn't, will not have the ability to otherwise get the money, to take a loan from the trustee. She won't have the ability to amend the trust in order to, in order to get the money back. What she will have the ability to do, though, and by the way, there's an issue regarding transfers for nonprofits, which I won't cover in this seminar. Uh, what she will have the ability to do, though, is to change the trustee. So if Mary is concerned that, for example, by naming her son Peter as the trustee, that perhaps at some point they may have a fight, Peter may change his mind about whether he's willing to, to distribute assets in order to get assets back to his mother. Um, at any time, Mary will, can retain the power to fire Peter and to name somebody else as the trustee. But other than that, she's, she cannot have the ability to amend the trust or the ability to get money directly back. So once again, assume that those are Mary's assets. In this situation, Mary may want to transfer this remainder interest in her, into her home to the trustee. She keeps a life estate in the property. She keeps complete control of the property until she dies. She knows that following her death, there'll be no probate. And she knows that five years following this transfer, if she needs to qualify for mass health, her remainder interest in the house will not be a countable asset. MassHealth would at that point have the right to lien her life estate so that if the property were sold during her lifetime, MassHealth would be entitled to some of the proceeds. Following Mary's death, however, 
that lien will evaporate because the life estate will evaporate. Mary may decide when she creates this or at a later point to actually transfer some of her other assets to the trustee of the trust. If she transfers anything in to the trust, five years following the date of that transfer, the assets that she transfers in will be safe. If she starts off by transferring her, this interest in her home and a year later uh, transfers other money into the trust, the home will be safe five years from today. The other assets will be safe six years from today, that is five years from the day on which she had actually made that transfer. So if Mary's concerned about these issues, then this is probably at least some of, the assets, some of her assets, her answer or her solution to the problem. So uh, if you found this, uh, this valuable, um, I hope you, and, you, and you're watching it and you want to watch it again or you want to watch any of the other programs that we've done or that Frank, to talk about elder law issues with Frank and Mary, you can watch our YouTube channel. Remember the goal of all, all of this is to try to help you sleep well at night. That's the goal. Um, uh, I really appreciate your uh, tuning in today. Um, this show should be coming up on your local cable station sometime in, starting sometime in, in uh, September. And it'll also be available on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law Frank and Mary. Thank you very much.